Thank you, Jez, and uh, good afternoon, everybody. It's great to be here in my hometown of Deal. Uh, and this, incidentally, is a Deal Golf Club blazer. Uh, and when those guys drawing saw me put it on, they thought, oh, Christ, I've got to get five more colours out now. <laughs> um, I want to start off with uh, the concept of nudging. And I saw a nudge uh, a few years ago. It was done in a New York school. And they wanted to encourage six to ten-year-olds not to take drugs. Now, they thought a very good idea to do it, a sort of subtle way of doing it, it would be to give them a pencil, and I have one of those pencils here, and on the pencil was written, too cool to do drugs. And they gave all these kids at the New York school the pencil reading, too cool to do drugs. A good nudge. Yes? No. Now, some of you haven't got this yet. <laughs> What happens, for those of you who haven't got it, what happens if a six-year-old child starts to use this pencil and it starts to wear down? Let me show you. <laughs> Too cool to do drugs becomes simply cool to do drugs. Simply just do drugs and finally, <laughs> drugs. <laughs> so nudges don't always work. <laughs> or rather, bad nudges never work. And, and that got me thinking about the whole biases and heuristics that we have. And I thought I'd spend about 15 minutes just showing you some biases that um, I think matter to our lives, to financial markets, to investment, to consumption, to advertising. But I'm not quite sure yet which ones I'm going to talk about. And I'll show you in a second why. So, thinking fast and slow, hands up who hasn't read fast and slow? Okay, that's a difficult question. Hands up who has read? It's a much easier question to answer because everyone can put their hands up. You've got to read it. It's fantastic, the idea we have two systems, a fast and a slow way of thinking, two modes. Uh, the thinking fast system, which has been referred to this morning, system one, very quick, very reactive, very emotional, very instinctive. And a more kind of cerebral, neocortex-y type analysis, conscious uh, data processing system two. And of course, most people in their jobs think that they're using system two all the time. And as uh, Jez pointed out earlier, it's probably more system one, even though we don't know how much system one we're using most of the day. It's probably the majority. And of course, the reason why system one is so good, and I refer back to Rob's point, it doesn't take much with any resources. It's quick, it's easy, instinctive, it's primeval, it's hardwired. And psychologists say we have about 150 biases. We have social biases, we have decision-making biases, probability biases, and memory biases. Uh, and the reason I, I, I want to just highlight how successful System 1 is, is that we would not be here without System 1. Because sometimes when you hear people talk about System 1 versus System 2, they assume System 1 is bad. No, it's a very efficient way of making decisions. It's just not always appropriate to the 21st century. But it's sure been pretty good for two or three million years. And, and, and here's my favorite example of System 1 versus System 2 thinking. You see these signs all over London. What do most people do, and this particularly refers to men, if they're walking in a busy street, a busy crowd, that, and they walk by and they see that sign? What do most men do? They tap their wallets. They, they tap it. They tap their wallet. <laughs> they, wallet. They, do, they do. They do. I've stood by these signs. About nine out of ten men will go, where would you stand if you were a pickpocket? <laughs> Trying to work out where people keep their wallets. And of course, when they take these signs down, pickpocketing incidents fall. So again, if you were really using System 2 all the time, you wouldn't tap your wallet when you see that sign, but our System 1 kicks in. It's very instinctive, very emotional. Um, again, just a, a, a comment from a psychologist called Gary Klein, who I like. Very simple equation. If you want to improve your performance at anything, you need to reduce your errors and uncertainties and increase your insights. Not rocket science. But where I think this reminds us is that actually the insights often come from system one thinking. So let's not be too rude about it. It can make mistakes in 21st century society, but actually it can be very useful for getting to the truths, insights. But system two for me is about cutting down the errors, reducing the errors. So what biases shall I talk about? Well, Everyone recognize this gentleman, Elvis Costello, one of my musical heroes. He does a uh, concert tour where he has a spinning songbook. And he's got about 60 songs on a huge wheel. And he spins the wheel. 
and he plays whatever song comes up. Uh, could I ask my glamorous assistants to please join me? Big hand, please, big hand. Thank you. Now, I couldn't quite afford the Elvis wheel, but I've got something with a few heuristics and a few biases on here. You can, hopefully you can make them out. I thought we'd just spin the wheel and have some fun. So, um, glamorous assistants. Kelly, thank you very much for joining me. Uh, would you please give a spin of the wheel? It would be my pleasure, Paul. You had me practice for 10,000 hours. <laughs> <laughs> the brain. Okay, the brain. Well, we, um, Rob's already given us a little insights into how the brain works. I think we make shortcuts. That's the first thing, and that's the first, I think, conclusion from Rob's talk. And it's quite good in a way to make shortcuts because it saves lots of time, energy, and resources. And stuff we're seeing in neuroscience in this day and age has been extraordinarily useful in determining which parts of the brain light up during certain activities or certain behaviors. And it struck me, for example, that when you get something like um, the parts of the brain that light up for pain, when you have a pain, are the same parts of the brain that light up when you feel socially excluded. And they've done lots of neuroscience. And if you think about it, the emotional language we use about you know, being left alone, it's very painful. We actually use sort of emotional language that describes actually what physical pain is like. And neuroscience teaches us this kind of stuff. And, um, you can have lots of fun with the brain, you can start playing with it. So, for example, let me give you an example, and, and you're going you're to have so much fun in the pub with this later. I want everybody just to take their right index finger and do a big number six. Just do a few number sixes in the air. Yeah? Everyone doing that? Now, second stage, stop the number sixes with your right foot only, and don't do anything with your hands, just do a clockwise circle. You could do a big or a small one. OK, everyone doing a clockwise circle though, right? Now, stage three, let's have some fun with your brain. Now try and do a number six in the air without your leg turning around the other way. <laughs> everyone got that? <laughs> if you want another go, oh, thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, anyway, so it, it, just to remember, it's number six. Stop them doing that clockwise, and then do number six again. It turns your leg around. It's, I love it. Where's my glamorous assistant gone? Oh, OK, stay there, so I'll do it again. Here we go. Nudges. OK, we've done a bit of nudging this morning already, and I talked about the pencil. Um, Last night, Kelly and I and others were talking about our favorite nudges in the world we'd ever seen. And the one I quite like, it was, a, it was a French wine bar, a French restaurant, I should say. And you know, in this day and age, we're always besieged by mobile phones, and you know, we don't want the phones on when we're actually eating. But you've got to remember to turn them off when you go in, and sometimes they buzz and vibrate. There is a sign on a French restaurant that reads, note, as you go into the restaurant, on the outside of the restaurant. And as you walk into the restaurant, the sign says this. Please do not forget to turn your phones back on when you leave this restaurant. Isn't that charming? No one's going to take offense to that? A lovely nudge. Um, lots of variations on the nudge theme. Uh, I quite like what I saw last year. It showed, um, it showed a, 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 a beggar, and it showed the beggar with about seven or eight bowls in front of him. And by each of the bowls, he had a little sign. And each sign had the name of a religion next to it. So Christian, Buddhist, Muslim, atheist, agnostic. And people were competing to fill up the bowls. Good nudge. Another spin? Oh, question mark. That gives me the right to do whatever I want. OK, let's do an experiment. Hands out in front of us. Cross your hands over. Turn your thumbs down. Clasp your hands together. 
Wiggle the fingers, thumbs. It's actually a lot easier if you have nice, a nice straight, nice straight arms there. Right, anyone now, it's exactly the same way. Thumbs pointing down, wiggle the little fingers again. Copy me. My thumbs, which are facing the floor, now face the ceiling. Thank you. You try. <laughs> I got hands of this stuff. Um, here we go. <laughs> last one, last one. Anchoring, okay, anchoring. So um, I think most people are aware of the concept of anchoring, the idea that if we, you can let your arms go now. You, you, you. <laughs> I did actually do a TED talk where I did this once, and about an hour later I left, and someone at the back was actually genuinely still still. I think she'd been hypnotized or something. Anyway, um, right, so let's just see if we can find anchoring. This is one of Danny Kahneman's original experiments about anchoring, and I think it's just genius. He got two different groups of people, and separately he asked one group of people, what, I'd have a guess, he said, what percentage of African countries in the United Nations? And one group was asked, the first question was, is it more or less than 65%? The second group was asked, is it more or less than 10% separately. And then each group was asked, OK, now you've had a guess, how many, uh, what, is, what do you think actually the percentage of African countries is in the United Nations? So put a number down. Extraordinary. In the 65% group, you thought on average there were about 45% countries. If you were in the 10% group for the first question, you thought there was something like 25%. We've done this with different experiments. So anchoring is a very, very, very powerful bias that we all suffer from. And where are the biggest um, anchors? I think they're in the media. And the media obviously reporting what's going on and what they think we want to hear and what, indeed what we do want to hear. But I put to you that uh, sometimes the media get it wrong. And I'm, if I see something on the front of newspapers or covers or books sort of consistently, it worries me. And I'm very aware that at the end of 1999, when the markets had been extraordinarily strong, the biggest bull market we'd had for many, 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 many decades, 20 years of un, almost you know, unstoppable growth in, in equities, the markets got to about 11,750 in the US. That was the high. Within a few months, these three books had come out just before and just afterwards. The Dow, it said, which was currently about 11,700, is going to 36,000. Oh, no, it's not, said someone else. It's going to 40,000. And finding words that scare me as an investor, if I hear someone say this, it's different this time. So imagine my delight when I found this book the other day. Dow, 100,000. <laughs> and it was written 1999. Let me just give you the first line of this. The future is never known with certainty, yet there are moments in history when powerful forces are so aligned that they allow us to anticipate with unusual confidence the shape of the future and the direction of financial markets. Now is one of, the mark one of, one of those moments. So what's my main message? What's my main conclusion? Always, always, always challenge your assumptions. And behavioral economics for me is about challenging our assumptions, using system two, when we have the resources, to challenge our assumptions. I don't know what you thought when I came on today wearing this striped blazer from Royal St. Ports Golf Club. I don't know what you thought when I got the book out, or put my glasses on, but remember, I don't even need lenses. Always challenge your assumptions. Thank you very much indeed.